Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Stefan Andersson. So Stefan received his PhD degree in electronic devices from Linköping University, and as a part of his PhD studies, he spent four months uh, at the Intel Communication Circuit oh. Lab, Hillsborough, USA. So he joined the Ericsson Group for the first time uh, as a designer uh, of analog and mixed signal circuits, a position he held for one year. And after his PhD studies, he joined Ericsson again, and now he is holding the position of the manager of the RF front end group at Ericsson Research. So. Thank you very much. So let's move over to the telecom business then. Uh, as Elena introduced me here, uh, I have a master, I have a PhD degree in electrical engineering, uh, and have been working 20 plus years now with analog and RF chip design. Uh, my current position now is a research manager for the RF front end and PE team at Ericsson Research, uh, where I also manager, but I'm still also active in actually doing circuit design, so uh, <laughs> not only a manager. Uh, short outline. Uh, I'll give you a short historical overview first. Uh, I think it's always important to know the history, uh, why we are where we are. Uh, look at some trends. Talk a little bit of IC technology limitations as we have. I will introduce you to 5G millimeter wave circuits and also say a few words of what I think the future looks like for uh, circuit designers. So if we start with a historical overview, uh, this is what it, look like, it looks like from the 1990s. Uh, you can see basically we have 1990 2G, simple phones, some of us remember them. Um, not at least how much it cost, then what the cost was to call and send SMS. Any idea? Voice call? About 50 cents to one euro per minute. SMS? 10, 15 cents? I leave it as an exercise to calculate the cost <laughs> per megabyte on that one. Uh, what we saw then in 2000 was introducing 3D, uh, early phase of mobile broadband. Some uh, calls, we actually had uh, video as well. Uh, moved over to 4G and the app economy. Uh, 5G is more about the digitalization of societies and industries and uh, being rolled out rolled out as we speak. And then we have something 2030 that we now then would like to call 6G, uh, which is very much still not set. We have visions, but we're not there yet. Uh, you can also see the amount of data speed increase in those 30 years between 1990 and 2020, one million times. This is quite impressive. Uh, looking at the mobile network traffic increase, uh, in fact, the mobile network traffic is driving the compute needs at a higher rate than Moore's law. And the thing behind this is, of course, the number of antenna branches is growing with massive MIMO. Uh, we have more carrier bandwidth at higher frequencies, which doesn't come for free. Uh, we have wider spectrum allocations in new frequency bands and shorter transmission time interval. And basically what you see here on the x-axis is basically how many antennas that are in each uh, base station. And you can see how the compute needs increase. Uh, mobile communication growth. Uh, what we have seen over the years now is about 50% year-on-year growth. Uh, and here you can also see the number of exabytes per month consumed in the world, steadily increasing. Uh, I hope that many of you 
know about Shannon's theorem. If you don't, you will. <laughs> uh, where we sort of have the capacity as a function of bandwidth. That's frequency. Frequency is uh, not an endless resource either. We have spectral efficiency, where you have signal to noise ratio, and you have the cell density. Uh, cellular networks, we usually refer to. So, what's a cell? Uh, typically, you have a base station serving a certain area, which we call a cell. And sometimes, I think you all see in those macro cells, you see a huge tower and you see a lot of antennas on the top serving a large, very large area. Um, that may be cost efficient, but maybe it's not the best way to optimize the capacity. Uh, that would be to have smaller cells instead. But no free lunch there either, so the cost would increase. What is 6G? Yeah. Give me a crystal ball. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think every university has its own vision, every company still. Uh, there are a lot of discussions. What should 6G be? What should it what should be included? Uh, one thing is for sure that uh, the total cost of operation is very, very important. I mean, we don't want to get back to a thing where we have to pay per minute or pay a lot of money to send an SMS or anything like that. At the same time, we also need to find ways for both us as well as the operators also to make money. Otherwise, they won't invest. Uh, being a circuit guy, I'm down to the numbers, communication, data rate will for sure increase. I would assume 100 gigabits per second. Latency, down to one millisecond. Uh, best 5G systems today, I would say about 10 milliseconds. So another factor of 10 here. Talking a lot about coverage, 100% coverage. That would mean also non-terrestrial networks. We will not put our base stations in the middle of the sea. Uh, we will rely on satellites in that case. And then capacity here uh, in dense areas, 100 megabits per second per square meter. Like in this room, for example. Uh, new features, data generation. I think many of you may have heard about joint sensing and communication, where you also <clears throat> would like to sense your environment, make a digital image of everything. Energy efficiency, we heard it before. Uh, it's okay to consume a lot of energy if you're doing something useful. But what we don't want is to use a lot of energy while the systems are basically idling and standby. Uh, this is not super easy because we never know when a phone call will be made or when you would pick up your phone and start consuming data. So we always have to be standby. Uh, and as I said, those are visions, right? Not that no standardization of 6G in 3GPP has happened yet. It's to come. Uh, looking a few, at a few more trends. <coughs> uh, 5G introduced beam forming at millimeter wave frequencies. Why, would, why move up to millimeter wave frequencies? It's of course to find the bandwidth and more capacity. And what we found up there is about 10x the bandwidth compared to what we have at sub 6 gigahertz. Uh, we can have extreme throughput in line of sight, right? It's very difficult to penetrate walls, buildings, even trees with a lot of leaves on them. And therefore, we also need to use beamforming to extend the coverage. I mean, focus the energy in the right direction. Why haven't we always done that? Yes, that's a good question. I mean, that is, of course, 
more energy efficient to do. But it is also a little bit problematic because you all have to track the users as well. Um, beam forming, it's also a little bit of a way also to cheat Shannon a little bit here, right? Because we can use the same frequency and the same bandwidth to different users. I could have one beam there, one there, and they can use exactly the same frequency again. And in that way, it's also a, a way to uh, have more capacity uh, uh, without densifying the networks. What's the beam? I think most of you would recognize it as the picture to the left. Nicely formed beam, one direction, well defined. Yeah. In most likely in line of sight. What if you don't have line of sight? You have multi paths. The energy is reflected in walls coinciding at the user. It may look like this instead, right? Uh, where you beam forming into the propagation directions of the channel. Uh, Moving on to analog beam forming and the circuits. Uh, I guess many of you have seen simple schematics. So what's needed to <clears throat> perform beam forming? In the simplest way, we introduce a few new blocks. Phase steering of each antenna element, that is required, or at least each group of antenna elements. That's a must. Often you see uh, individual gain control of each antenna element as well. But it's not really required for forming a beam. That is if you want to reduce the side lobe levels, the energy that we send in the wrong directions. So. Uh, when you look at this figure here, I mean, what does the intuition tell you? If you instead have a frequency instead of an angle and degrees <coughs> on the x-axis, what does it look like? It's a filter. It's an FIR filter. And if you have worked with digital filters, you probably recognize this also as a rectangular window. So think of the array as a two-dimensional FIR filter. There are other ways to do it as well. Um, sometimes you hear about hybrid beamforming, digital beamforming. Digital beamforming is really simple, really. You just put one transceiver per antenna element, and you digitize it, and then you, compute, uh, you do the rest of the computing uh, in digital domain. The drawback, it's very costly. It takes a lot of hardware. You need a lot of data converters, and it also drives up the power consumption. Uh, hybrid beamforming can be a compromise where you typically have digital beamforming in this direction, where we have many users, maybe use analog beam forming in elevation instead. I mean, all of you here in this room are just sitting on the same level, so it's not much, not really a reason to uh, beam forming in this direction in here. Uh, some interesting phenomena can happen if you work with analog beam forming. One of them is called beam squinting. So what does that mean? That is, if you have a very wide relative bandwidth compared to the carrier frequency. A few gigahertz bandwidth, 28 gigahertz, or 25 in this case, 25 gigahertz carrier bandwidth. The signal you have at the band edges will not have the same direction as the center frequency due to this. The reason is simple. When you do phase steering, 
yes, if you only look at the sine wave, it doesn't matter if you face, I mean, how many cycles you are wrong when you face steer it, right? You will always come back to the same angle. But that's not the case when you have a modulated signal. You would need a true time delay to compensate for this. High frequency operation. Uh, we're talking sometimes in 60, you probably hear it, uh, we're talking about sub terahertz, 100 gigahertz and above, uh, where we really would need larger arrays to overcome the path loss. Can't fight the physics. Uh, typically, we say that a maximum base station antenna area is about one square millimeter. And that's related and limited by the wind load if you put it in a tower. Uh, if we talk at those, about those frequencies at 100 gigahertz and you start calculating how many antenna elements you could fit in that area, it's pretty many. Over 100,000. I don't know what to think about that, but uh, I think that would be really challenging from a circuit perspective uh, going forward if we try that. Uh, talking a little bit of IC technology and those limitations, uh, I call it some uncomfortable facts, uh, and that is one technology does not fit all needs. Uh, we have to compromise performance, cost, size, integration level. Heterogeneous integration where we combine chips from different technologies can solve this to some extent, but not entirely remove them. And I will show you why soon. Uh, another thing is that the technology we use in our designs today may not be the same technologies as are used five years from now in products. And uh, also moving up in frequency, I would say we need FDF max at least three times the carrier frequency to make something useful uh, and not only produce heat. Um, we also see that Moore's law is slowing down. Uh, I think digital scaling is still doing okay-ish. We still see power savings. Uh, RF and analog are more pessimistic. I don't think we see exactly the same benefits from scaling anymore. Um, moving up in frequency, maybe we see a comeback for bi-CMOS technologies and silicon and germanium bi-CMOS uh, with slightly higher FDF max than CMOS. We see a lot of activities in gallium nitride, gallium nitride and silicon. Uh, can operate at higher temperature, better for power amplifiers. But you will also at this conference see there are plenty of technology and a lot of research going on. Uh, but the problem is not to make one transistor, the problem is to mass produce and make chips with billions of transistors. If we talk a little bit about technologies and, for example, the power amplifiers. Um, an old paper from 58, and you have an equation there, Johnson limit. The product there of out of power, impedance, and max operating frequency is equal to a material constant. And here you can see, okay, if we were to design a power amplifier, the best power amplifier we can design, yeah, let's go for a gallium nitride. But sometimes we need more than a power amplifier. We need a full transceiver. And then it's not so simple here to just pick and choose between technologies. So often when we talk about make the compromise cost, or cost and integration level and all, we usually end up with the silicon column there anyway. Uh, High frequency technology limitations. Uh, as I said, sub terahertz, difficult. We're approaching FDF max. 
it's costly to even generate any gain at all. Uh, you see that power efficiency drops, noise figure increase, all routing losses increase dramatically. Uh, but we also see one more thing, and that is that if you take an antenna array at 100 gigahertz, you see that you have about 1.5 millimeters between the antenna elements. And that's the area where you need to fit the circuit. And that's why we can't pick and choose between technologies. We have to have, make a compromise here, have something where we can uh, fit the circuit behind the antenna. Uh, I'll show you a few circuits uh, so you know what you will be doing as electrical engineers. Uh, this is the one example here. Is that this is the first uh, 5 millimeter wave radio uh, that was built at Ericsson. It's a bi-CMOS technology. Um, what to look at here? Uh, you see the uh, antenna panel here. 64 antenna ports. Okay, I know there are 100 there. The outer ring is a ring of dummy elements for every, so that every antenna sees the same boundary conditions. You see on the back of the antenna, PCB, that's where you mount the circuit. And that is this circuit containing then uh, all the transceivers uh, necessary for analog beamforming. Looking a little bit more into uh, design, what we have been doing then at the research department, uh, we soon realized that we need to cost optimize this for it to work well. Uh, starting working a lot with CMOS and then we chose uh, fully depleted SOI as the best compromise, we thought at least. Uh, where do you start? Well, you start with designing one transceiver one receiver, look at the uh, Linnaeus, mixers, analog to digital converters, design it, measure it, and in parallel, of course, you all know that you also need a transmitter. Uh, so that was designed uh, slightly after, while waiting for the first chip to come back. Once you evaluate those, you realize that, okay, now it's time to build a small circuit here that where we can try things out from a beamforming perspective. Uh, in this case, the idea was also to abandon the analog beamforming and work more on a hybrid beamforming. Uh, once you've done that circuit, it's time to make sort of a prototype for a product. And that's when you see this 32 TRX uh, design. And uh, then after that, you also realize that, okay, there are still things to optimize here. Um, power efficiency, for example. So then the next initiative was to look into Doherty power amplifiers for millimeter waves as well. Um, you can find those designs. Uh, we at Ericsson Research, we publish most of our work. So uh, they are available. Uh, in the IEEE database. Uh, I will just show you a little bit more zoomed in version of these 32 transceivers. Uh, what you see here is 16 transceivers at the bottom, 16 transceivers at the top, and then there's also a lot of digital circuitry. Um, Quite complex, um, close to the limit actually how big chip uh, you're allowed to design uh, in this technology. Um, but that's what it takes to make those uh, arrays. What will you be doing as electrical engineers? 
first, of course, you need to know about transceiver architectures. There's a lot to learn, and there's a lot of different things to think of. Uh, I think someone said this morning that hand calculations are no good, but I don't completely agree because you need them. Otherwise, you don't know when you do your simulations what directions should you move in. You have the computer power nowadays. You can do a lot of sweeps, but it will take you longer time to analyze all those sweeps than to actually get to know a bit of circuit uh, theory so you know what to change. Once you've done that, you need some electromagnetic simulations. You need to model certain things. IOS, how to get the signal out from the chip as well. Then it's time to do the full layout of the chip. Uh, you have to work with the people doing the printed circuit board. And then finally, go to the lab and power up the circuit. And that's, that's where exciting time starts. I know that there are some companies where you typically specialize, you do certain things here. Uh, I don't like that part. I mean, if you do a circuit design, you should be in the lab as well doing the evaluation. Because that's, a, that's where you can learn things. It's very seldom that you see exactly where you simulated. There are always problems with the measurement setups and all things like that. So be in the lab, that's also very important for all of you to really learn. Uh, okay, future of circuit designers. Uh, I think we see a huge increase in design complexity. I mean, you saw the circuit here with 32 transceivers for uh, beamforming. Um, and it's, it will only get worse when it comes to complexity. And you also have to understand the impact of the design choices you make. Uh, we see that Moore's law is slowing down. That means that we need skilled designers to keep up instead. I mean, historically, I mean, it has been better to move to a newer technology than to actually optimize designs but that's about to stop. Uh, another thing here, some of you may look at analog design and someone wants to work with digital design. I don't think it's a question about analog or digital. Uh, I think it's both. Um, another thing here, you now see a lot of investments being made, not least in Europe. <coughs> Our companies like ours, I mean, we question basically where we can find all those electrical engineers to make things happen. So I think you make, have made a good choice. And um, least but not, last but not least, I mean, don't forget to have fun as well. Do what you think is fun. That's the way to be good at things as well. If you don't think it's fun, Make a slight twist and do something different. I mean, you see there are many, many topics here for an electrical engineer as well. Uh, and finally, then, I would like to thank my colleagues at Ericsson as well for helping out with the presentation. Now we have a couple of minutes for a discussion. So, do you have any questions? Yes, okay, just there. Thank you for the interesting talk. I have a bit of a philosophical question. <laughs> Ever since I had internet on my phone, it's been limited. As in, if I really start doing the traffic, it's only a few minutes before my whole monthly allocation is gone. If I use my phone to do, let's say, the most intense thing, like watching a 4K video, there's one hour in there. Is there something fundamentally changing in 6G that 
going to say I can use my internet on my mobile phone in a way that I don't feel it's limited? You mean that you have a limited uh, number of gigabytes in your yes, yes. subscription? Yeah. I think the key there is cost, right, for the system. Um, if we look back in history, I think you're, you're probably paying as much today as you did in the 1990s in total. Uh, so uh, if we can make the 60 system more, more cost effective, <coughs> the operators will you know, compete with each other and uh, I think yeah, the number of gigabytes will also increase in the subscription. Sending a picture is cheaper today than 10 years ago, but yes. the more advanced application, the most advanced thing I can do with a phone is still very, very limited in how much I can do it. So if we're moving to, okay, let's see, VR on the phone, you understand what I mean? Yes, uh, I see what you mean. I, th I think that remains to be seen how the operators would, would like to capitalize on, on this. Um, but for sure, I mean, as we say, I mean, frequency data, it, it's a limited resource, yeah. of course. And uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Um, you mentioned uh, here at the end and earlier before too that Moore's law is slowing down. Mm. Um, what? What's your, uh, on your opinion, uh, what's the next step once we cannot fit any, any more transistors on a ship and we have already optimized all our systems um, nowadays? What's the next thing we should do on your opinion, on telecom and other areas? Mm. Engineers are creative, right? We will always find ways to squeeze in more transistors. You've seen it, 3D stacking, for example, right? Um, I think the problem we see now is maybe the cooling part of it. I mean, we can probably build and stack things already today, but we have difficulty to remove the heat. Um, so I, I think there's still ways to do this, but I mean, it, it takes some engineering effort to. Uh, so maybe to finding any other ways to cool it down to maybe. Uh I don't know, asking more out of the system so we can um, kind of keep up with the operations doing at mm. the, the second, nanosecond, whatever. Um, yeah, so just cooling down is the, uh, the current, in your opinion. I think, yeah. I, think, I think we already see today that, I mean, we can integrate more than we can actually handle from a thermal perspective. So, um, that's definitely a showstopper. Um, then, I mean, eventually, I mean, you, you, you can't scale down things to infinity, right? We, we've, we've done this now. We are approaching three nanometer, two nanometers going forward, right? But you have the atomic layers, and I think there it will stop, basically. Yes. That, that's what the question was all about. Um, yeah. Once we get to that limit, how should we go forwards? Once we reach that, uh, once it gets like so small that we cannot make it smaller, we cannot fit any more transistors on a ship, that we have to make anything else. But you have, but you still have the third dimension, right? Yeah, you, you can put them layers on layers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned the third dimension yeah. and everything about the cooling. I was just asking about that. Yeah. So maybe that the, the question is already answered. <laughs> it's one, one, one answer at least. Bluetooth is. I think I think people know what Bluetooth is, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. That's a former colleague of mine. 
Is that what you mean, Andrea? Yeah, the story of the, the story the of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, at Ericsson, a guy called Sven Mattisson, a former colleague of mine, uh, one of, of the co-inventors of Bluetooth. And who is Bluetooth? Bluetooth. Who is that? Is <laughs> that's an, an, a Danish king from the Viking era. <laughs> um, so um, in Swedish called Harald Blåtand. <laughs> okay, so thank you.